probably for, throughout Advent and Christmas, we have been hearing accounts of angels. Now, if you're anything like me, though, you might have ignored them, those angels, when it really comes down to it. Or I don't know if I really ignore them as much as I kind of put them in my own nostalgic Christmas compartment. You know, oh yeah, the angels are there, you know, bringing good news, but I don't really focus in on them. But they've been there week after week. Today's gospel story is the history of something so urgent, however, that I finally sit up and take notice, that I take this angel seriously. And I ask myself, what if it had been different? What if Mary, who was very young, and I think we can believe was scared to death, what if Mary experienced that appearance and yet was so scared that she didn't tell a soul? didn't tell her family, didn't tell her betrothed, just slipped away into oblivion. Or what if Elizabeth, who um, actually responded as this older woman of wisdom, you know, to this young woman coming to her, and had eyes of faith and encouragement at these surprising pregnancies, what if she saw them as mere coincidences? She was old, She'd actually been kicked around a little bit. What if she was just cynical and said, uh, you know, coincidence, or worse yet, some sort of bad joke of God. You know, here in her ancient age, she's having a baby, and this young girl has this wild story. And then in today's gospel, what about Joseph? What if Joseph, who I can imagine is practical, you know, I could see him as a practical, hands-on kind of guy. What if he says a dream is a dream? Or, well, I had a bit of wine last night, you know? What if he ignored what he experienced? We don't have a lot of historical record that Herod killed masses of infants, but it would be in his character. Herod actually killed three of his own sons so that they would not rival him to be king. So what if Joseph forgot the dream, washed his face, put on his carpenter's belt, you know, and went to work? What if they acted the way I think we do sometimes? What if they forgot the dreams, rationalize the coincidences, and dismiss the angels. Most nations and cultures, if you study them, have some belief in some variety of angelic beings. And the Bible actually has over almost 300 allusions to angels. I don't think I realized that. 300 places where angels appear in our scriptures. The word for angel in Greek, angelos, means one sent or messenger. That kind of helps me get it out of my compartmentalized box. You know, it's not necessarily the wings. You know, let the wings go. It's a messenger from God. So dreams, coincidences, appearances might all be ways God is trying to communicate to us, to love us. The purpose of angels, it seems, is to serve God and to regenerate humankind, to make things new, to newly connect us to God's love. Our Ephesians passage says, God is blessing us in Jesus with every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing. And I think we have to be open to the fact 
that those might look different than our day-to-day -day things, you know? That if these are spiritual blessings, if these are from God's realms, they might have a twist. They might be just a little bit different. I think that God would want us to take the same kind of belief to these things that we do too much in the natural order. I'm not much of a scientist, and some of you are more, but I can believe in the structure of an atom, even though I never see it. I believe that somehow through this copper wiring, electricity is surging to turn those lights on. Can I believe that God is using things that I don't perceive? A lot of times, angels in the Bible are invisible. Sometimes, occasionally, they're visible, but a lot of times, they're imperceivable to our eyes. Still believe in them. As Mary did, and Joseph did, and Elizabeth did, and then if you go back as Moses did, you know, a burning bush, it's not, a, is that an angel? Well, it was a message, you know? God speaking to Moses in that way. Daniel with the lion's dead, and you can go on and on. Jacob wrestling, right? We have people to encourage us. Billy Graham wrote a book on angels, and I want to read you a wonderful story, a modern-day story. A celebrated Philadelphia neurologist had gone to bed after an exceptionally tiring day. Suddenly, he was awakened by someone knocking on his door. Opening it, he found a little girl, poorly dressed and deeply upset. She told him her mother was very sick and asked him if he would please come with her. It was a bitterly cold, snowy night, but though he was bone tired, the doctor dressed and followed the girl. As the Reader's Digest reports the story, he found the mother desperately ill with pneumonia. After arranging for medical care, he complimented the sick woman on the intelligence and persistence of her little daughter. The woman looked at him strangely and then said, my daughter died a month ago. She added, her shoes and coat are in the closet there. Amazed and perplexed, the doctor went to the closet and opened the door. There hung the very coat worn by the little girl who had brought him to tend to her mother. It was warm and dry and could not possibly have been out in the wintry night. Could the doctor have been called in the hour of desperate need by an angel who appeared as this woman's young daughter? Was this the work of God's angels on behalf of the sick woman? It's a powerful story. I think that we have two main problems listening to angels and messages from God. One is, I think we don't slow down or pray enough to even notice them. So we might be sitting there in the pew saying, well, this is all fine, but really, nothing's ever happened, <laughs> you know? I might listen if something ever happened, but maybe we need to pray more. Or I think the other problem is that, if you ever notice, angels, often their, the first words out of their mouths are, fear not. Because to open ourselves up to the supernatural is scary. And I think it can also open us up to our own craziness. You know, we don't want our imaginations to just take off. But I think that today's gospel can give us some hands-on guides. If we think about Joseph, he did listen and he obeyed. If you read the scripture, he does exactly what the angel tells him. He rises, and it says he rises at night, which shows that both it was politically urgent and that he obeyed really well. If he heard he got up, they went. So we can hear and obey, think of Joseph that way, act on what, what makes sense. But some other things are in the scripture too. One is uh, a passage from Hosea is raised. And we can always ground experiences we have by going to scripture. We want to make sure that what we think we're hearing fits with the thrust of the, of the Holy Scriptures. That can give us that kind of grounding. You know, and we see it reflected there. A 
especially in love. It's always going to be something that serves others, gives health to ourselves, serves God. And lastly, Joseph also, if you look at the story carefully, had to use his own brain. That is that point where he hears that Archelaus has become king. And he pauses and he thinks about where exactly he, he listens and obeys, but he also has to do some thinking of his own. And I think that's the way it is with God's messages. God gives us a word, and then we have to work it out and exactly how that's going to be birthed. It is birthed in a way that we can live.